that oftentimes we have heard concerning who we are, what we can do, and what we are able to achieve. This challenges the thought that we only exist for ourselves, that we have, do not have too much, that we are needy ourselves, that we are in a situation where we continue to need help. This challenges that status quo and begins to point out to us that we need to move out, that there is more land out there, that we need to get out and engage so that God would use us to bring transformation in the nations of the world today. Can you shout amen? And your senior pastor asked me to speak from the book of Joshua chapter 13, verse 1 through verse 7, more land to be conquered. Joshua 13, verse 1 through 7, allow me to read this for us. Now Joshua was old, advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, you are old advanced in years and there remains very much land yet to be possessed this is the land that yet remains all the territory of the philistines and all that of uh, of the uh, geshurites from sihor which is east of egypt as far as border of ekron northward which is counted as canaanite the five lords of the philistines the, uh, the Gazites, the Ashdodites, the Ash uh, Ashkelonites, and the Gittites, and the Akronites, also the Avites, from the south, all the land of the Canaanites, and Mera, that belongs to the Sid Sidonians, as far as Afek, to the border of the Amorites, the land of the Gibalites, and all Lebanon towards the sunrise from Balgad below Mount Hammon as far as the entrance of, uh, to Hamath. All the inhabitants of the mountains from Lebanon as far as the brook Misrepoth and all the Sidonians. When them I will drive out from before the children of Israel. Only divide it by lot to Israel as an inheritance as I have commanded you. Now therefore... Divide this land as an inheritance to the nine tribes and half the tribe of Manasseh. I'd like you to eavesdrop as I preach to myself. This week, by the grace of God, I achieved a significant milestone birthday in my life. That kind of birthday that when you achieve it, you begin feeling like Joshua. Now you are old and advanced in years. And sometimes when you reach that stage, you begin wondering whether you should continue on doing the work uh, or like we used to do in the old public service uh, president before you came in, they used to give them wheelbarrows. It had different significance then, showing they are meant to be going home. You are old and advanced in years. Dr. Charles McCoy was a pastor at Oyster Bay, Long Island, a 71-year-old bachelor looking for a place to retire after 50 years of faithful ministry as a pastor and an evangelist. He had invited a bishop from India to come to his church to plead for missionaries' help to India. Dr. McCoy prayed that God would lay it in the heart of someone in the congregation to respond to this call to go to India. After the third message by the bishop from India, the bishop turned to Dr. McCoy and said, I don't think God is looking for someone from the congregation. I think he's looking for someone behind this pulpit. Dr. McCoy, a 71-year-old man, responded hardly believing his ears 
Bishop, are you losing your mind? I am 71 years, never been overseas, I've never been on the oceans, and the thought of flying terrifies me. But soon, a new missionary was on his way at the age of 71 years, having responded to that call by the bishop and ministered to many, many countries. As a matter of fact, going 10 times over in many, many countries, ministering to the word of the Lord. There are times when you reach a stage in life where if you hear a word from the Lord, you begin wondering whether God is not making a mistake. The book of Joshua presents to us the narrative of transitions between Moses and Joshua. It presents to us the narrative of transition between a pastoralist community and a sedentary community that is settled where they are. And in this narrative, there were promised pieces of land and property that they were to conquer and to overtake. And Joshua had worked very hard in attempting to do so. And they had conquered many, many regions across both sides of the Jordan, the Transjordan, as we call them. But now here he is. Scholars would estimate a 100-year-old man. And he's thinking, maybe it's time now to go home when the Lord speaks with him. Allow me to bring very, very quickly some three points of reflection for us before we conclude this service. First of all, verse 1, the status of the conquest. When God speaks about the status of the conquest, uh, he points out to two dimensions. Uh, he points out to the leader and he points out uh, to the land, the task that they were meant to do. And he turns to the leader and he says, you are old and advanced in years. Now the phrase old and advanced in years uh, may actually speak uh, very different things to different people. At the age of 100 that Joshua was, it may have communicated a very, very different thing. Perhaps he should have turned and said around, Mzeni nani, mzeni, wewe. People who tend to reject age and term it ageism and begin seeing it as a discrimination against growing old. And such individuals uh, tend to tenaciously cling to matters of youth uh, without allowing matters of youth uh, to have any room or any role, in, without allowing the matters of age in spite of what their hair might be showing. The deputy bishop and I were talking today. <laughs> We've generally agreed to let our hair remain white. But such individuals would get into youth because they are denying age. Such individuals would begin driving cars with spinners on them. Such individuals would begin dressing and changing their outlook just to be in a different site and to communicate a different thing that actually age is far away from them. But regardless of how much we would try to change the clock usually ticks and it begins showing you now you are old and advanced in years. To some, therefore, such a word begins to discourage them because they begin seeing themselves as spent cartridge. The years of usefulness are gone. You are headed for the shelf. Your uh, lifespan is over. Age has caught up with you. As a result of that, uh, some people totally give up from trying anything new because they feel in a 
it's, uh, it's time now just to hang the boots uh, and say it's all over. Negative sentiments uh, that brings them down from even in, uh, attempting to achieve what God would want them to achieve. I wonder whether in our midst today there may be individuals who perhaps have given up from trying one more time. Whether in our midst there may be individuals who because of your circumstance and situation you have hung up the boot. Whether in our midst there may be individuals who are feeling there is no need for me to even attempt. This is all my lot. This is all my portion. I can't do any better than this at all. I attended a consultation in one African country. And a physics professor, who was one of the presenters, got up and he spoke about the continent of Africa. And this is what he said, I quote, Africa is slipping from the third world to its own category, the nth world. The shape of Africa is a gloomy question mark, a part of the world where children have swollen bellies and sad eyes, where soldiers blast away at each other in endless wars for incomprehensible reasons. Africa today marches towards total catastrophe. The good professor went on. The only reason Africa still stands is that it does not know which direction to fall. Africa is like a star which has abandoned the law of gravity of its original constellation and has become a wandering star which will remain so unless it finds an autonomous direction in its trajectory. When the good professor finished his presentation, I raised up my hands. I said, sir, do we live in the same continent? In spite of the negatives, in spite of all those things that are being said, I'm one of those who is totally convinced that there is a new thing happening in the continent of Africa, that God is beginning to raise us up, that we do not have to be contented with our status quo, that we do not have to allow others to define us that we are third world, we were never in a competition and got to third world, that it is time for us to rise up and change this narrative of where we are, what we can do and what God is doing through this continent. And so as a continent, as individuals, but like individuals, so sometimes it is to a congregation. That a congregation can come to that point where it actually just exists. It allows lethargy, lukewarmness creeps in to the extent the freshness they once used to experience remains more a historical sense that they reminisce about rather than something that they encounter on a day by day basis. The Episcopal Church of America once uh, 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 drafted a statement that showed the life cycle of a church. A church goes through birth. A church goes through growth. A church goes through stability. But a church can also experience a decline and death. And the death does not necessarily mean the doors are closed. One of the saddest statements I read recently was of a, 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 a minister a church minister in a church in, 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 in England, the Mennonite church in England, when the elder stood by the door of the church and finally shut the doors, padlocked it, and the elder made a statement. He said, we could not convince the next generation that the church was relevant to them. And so, as an elder, I'm the last one 
he closed the church. The last Mennonite church in the UK closed down. Canon Patrick Sukdeo, a man I highly respect, a one time advisor to Kofi Annan, an advisor to many other international organizations, has written in his book, The Death of Western Christianity. And he says this The church in the West, once blazed strongly for centuries, the Bible was at the heart of European culture and the cultures of North Africa and Australasia. Society at levels recognized God and the worker in the world and gave allegiance, even if nominally, to the Lord Jesus Christ. But this has changed. The fire is now dying. The flame is faintly flickering. It has burned down to embers, though not extinguished. In his opinion, the Western church is a dying church. Friends, I do believe that God has invited us to be able to rise up and not be settled where we are because God would want to change the narratives about the continent of Africa, about the church of Africa, about what he can do through us because there is more opportunities there, more contributions that the church in Africa can make more greater impact that we can make in families, in institutions, including institutions of government, as we send our members who love the Lord Jesus Christ and know the Lord Jesus Christ into those institutions as ambassadors of change, that wherever they are, they are bringing changes for the glory and the honor of the Lord. They are bringing transformation. Something is happening through them, whether they are just in an office, sweeping the office, whether they are the CEOs, whether there are significant people but individuals who have gone in believing I am not just going to settle here to occupy a desk or to occupy an office I am here because I am an agent of transformation to bring transformation in this domain for the glory and the honor of God's name as Franz Fanon has said each generation might out of a relative obscurity discover its mission Fulfill it or betray it. Got to fulfill our vision or betray it. But the Lord spoke to Joshua that there's more land out there that remains. As a matter of fact, some people think there is a contradiction because when you read chapter 11 verse 23, it says this. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had said to Moses. Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to their division by their tribes. Then the land rested from war. And how can he then in chapter 13 come back and say there is more land to be conquered when it appears that he had already conquered? You see, what happens was that there are pockets and regions that had been promised to them but was still occupied by foreign territories. And these regions that were promised to them, God wanted them to possess them. They were there. There were promises that God had given to them. There were areas that they needed to know about. And God goes on in the next session just to give a list of this region, which are promised, but they have not taken them. Interestingly, this also can be said of individuals. This also can be said of families. This also can be said of the church that sometimes there are certain promises that God has given to us touching on our lives as individuals. Promises that God has given to us touching on our homes, touching on our families, touching on our businesses, touching on our impact as Christians. And yet somehow we watch them from afar. We look at them. We do not rise up to possess them. We miss those opportunities because we are not keen enough to rise up and reach those areas at the point that God is actually pointing them out to us to reach out and possess these regions.
a stranger figure visited a family, a man and a woman in their home one night. And the figure told them, you have three opportunities. Whatever you will wish or express this night, three opportunities, it will happen to you. And the man thought to himself and he said, I haven't had a good cuckoo for a long time. <laughs> if I only had some chicken and ugali here, pa on the table, the chicken and ugali were there. The wife was offended. She said, what have you done? Here was our chance to get something significant. You are behaving just like a chicken. And there the husband goes. Start coo -coo 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 -coo, like a chicken. Turns into a chicken. The wife has one last chance to wish. What will she wish for? For her husband to become human again. Three opportunities, all of them missed. And ladies and gentlemen, we are living in a moment and a time when God is giving us opportunities. Opportunities for us to reach out and engage. When I'm talking of us uh, uh, going to the neighboring country for the first time in my life, Your Excellency. I was driven in a bulletproof car. When we are talking of going out into these regions and going out to other territories, that there are opportunities, single opportunities that God has given us in our families, God has given us in our homes, God has given us in this neighborhood of Karen, God has given us in this country opportunities in offices that some of us are neglecting and ignoring, opportunities that we need to go out and say, here is an opportunity that we are going to possess some more land that needs to be possessed. So God gives Joshua the scope of the vision in verse 2 through 5 of what they needed to conquer. And in the scope of vision, God basically narrates the geography of the areas, the north, the south, the regions that were yet to be conquered. And he says, see this vision, see these areas. These are areas that you still need to possess and grab. These are areas that you need to bring within your domain. These are regions that you need to allow God to help you with. As a matter of fact, as Christians, sometimes it's even helpful to record down what is this that God is saying to me in my heart? What is this vision that God is giving to me for next year? What is this vision that God is giving to me for my church, for the ministry that I am heading, I'm leading? For the institutions that are around me or institutions that I'm serving. What is this vision? A clear mental image of a preferred future imparted by God is what we call a vision. This clear mental image that you can be able to think about and say, this is what we want. This is what we have. Some of us, our vision is too little. We have settled for too little. The potential that is within us compared to where we are at and what we are doing, we have settled for too little. That God may allow us to begin entering in into a domain where we allow him to lead us on to make a greater impact in the nation. The dimensions that he has spoken to us. The church when it started was a church that was active, a church that was involved. As we read in the history of the church, we are told the first apostles, 12 in number, in the power of God, went out and proclaimed Christ to every race of men there is not a single race of men whether barbarians or Greek or whatever they may be called nomads or vagrants or herdsmen dwelling in tents among whom prayers and giving of thanks is not offered through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ 12 in number but the impact was tremendous why? they caught the vision 
They caught the vision of the world. They caught the vision of the needy. They caught the vision of the domains that God wanted them to reach. And I pray that God will give Sitam Karen a greater vision that we would not settle for where we are at. That we'll begin to think, hey, there is more land for us to conquer. There are institutions all around us. We need even to begin reaching out to other neighborhoods. That God may give us that vision. That as individuals, we may also begin to flow and allow the Lord to lead us that we are not stopping at the 25th anniversary, we are moving out to the domains and the direction that God is leading us into. Mobilize every member of the church to be engaged in reaching out. When Oliver Cromwell served as prime minister in England at some point, they were lacking silver and he sent Silver coins, he sent uh, his uh, uh, emissaries uh, to go and look for silver coins. And they came back to him and they said, Sir, we could not get any silver at all. The only silver we could get were the statues of the saints which were in the churches. To which Oliver Cromwell responded and said, Excellent. Melt the saints and put them into circulation. Melt the saints and put them into circulation. And it is possible that within our churches, and I do hope not in Sitam Karen, that we have certain saints that needs to be melted and put in circulation so that they would begin to make an impact and bring changes for the glory and the honor of God. What is the strategy that God uses? Verse 6 and 7, and I close with this. The strategy that God uses is very, very simple. He says this, then I will drive out from before the children of Israel, only divide it by lot to Israel as an inheritance as I have commanded you. Here are the promises that God has given to them. And God says, go and possess the land. But God also says, actually, you're not the ones going to possess the land. I will drive your enemies before you. I will be the one going ahead of you. I will be the one bringing the changes, the transformation. You just need to come with me. I will be the one who will be bringing the victory to you. The victory belongs to the Lord. How many of us, while we are faced with situation, have gone through those moments when we have felt like we cannot go on anymore. How many of us have been faced with circumstances that have been so difficult for us and yet how great it is to turn our gaze not to our own qualifications, not to our own abilities, not to our own resources, not to our own strength, but to the resource of the living God who reigns and lives and be able to plug in into his power and allowing him to act accomplish his task through us and so God says I will do this to you there is more land to be conquered you are not going alone I'm going to accompany you to bring the changes I'm going to accompany you to bring the transformation I will work through you so that in the final end he the sovereign lord of all the earth will be the one who will receive all the praise all the glory all the honor for what has happened the living God who rules as and reigns as King Eternal. Without this sense of unworthiness, one sometimes has the attitude that God must be very lucky to have him or her as a servant. The thought that the church indeed may be very privileged to have you serve in that ministry where you are serving. But when we put things in the right perspective, and see that it is God. We are humbled to the extent we come back to God and say, all the glory, all the honor belongs to you. And worthy servants, we have only done our duty as we allow the Lord to lead us on. It's hard to tell. I used to pray. I used to ask God if he would come and help me. Then I asked God if I could come and help him. Then I ended up by asking God to do his own work through me. It is not asking God, can I help you? It is
is just allowing God, God, do what needs to be done to possess the land and the territories, to conquer this neighborhood for the glory of the living God. We must allow God to take the preeminence in our lives. And for us to do that, we must allow him to be a partner in our lives. One who dwells in us, one who leads us, one who takes control, one whom we are surrendered to, one whom we acknowledge as Lord so that we are not the ones who are calling the shot. It is the Lord who is calling the shot because he's the one guiding us. We have yielded and totally surrendered ourselves to him. Then we can go out and conquer the territories. Let's bow down before the Father. Our Father and our God, we thank you. And we honor you that you use ordinary people. Who would have thought that 150 people coming to this church 25 years ago would see it become what it is today. We thank you. We bless you. We praise you. You use ordinary people. I pray for myself as I pray for my brothers and my sisters here. Some of us who may be very discouraged because of the circumstances which are around us. It may not be age-based. It may be health-based. It may be resource-based. It may be circumstances that are totally beyond us, Lord. And yet that in those very spheres we would submit and surrender ourselves to you and allow you to have the preeminence as Lord. So take the first place we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. I would encourage anyone. Thank you very much. I would encourage anyone who has never made this decision to allow the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. That's where it begins. And when it starts there, it's a marvelous, marvelous journey. The music team wanted to help me sing. We are marching on with hearts courageous as we step out.